CMS um, speaker policy series. And for those of you who have not been here before, CMS is the Carbon Monitoring Systems Initiative. We started a policy series as part of our research for CMS, and it's really to bring in people in the industry of different type of carbon science, whether it's biomass, it's flux, or ocean um, carbon, bring it to Goddard, bring it to NASA, and give us some perspective on how decisions are made or how products are really used outside of the NASA institution, and really give us some understanding of how CMS could be valued outside of, um, outside of the research realm. So today's speaker is Jeremy Freund from Wildlife Works Carbon. Um, I'm going to allow him to give you his fantastic bio, but he'll be giving us um, his experiences and in just insight on MRV and his experiences in the Congo. And um, he will be taking questions towards the end, if we don't mind holding that towards the end, it's appreciated. Um, these sessions are recorded on Adobe Connect. Today will be a little bit of an abrupt end. Our Adobe Connect sh ends sharply at 1 o'clock. So for those of us that are logged into Adobe, please know that you can still continue discussion after 1 via the telecon, but the video recording will end promptly at 1. So um, the CMS Policy Series is also co-hosted by the Joint Global Carbon Cycle Center, and there are refreshments um, in the room courtesy of the JGCCC. So without any further delay, Jeremy, thank you. And um, we are all yours. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Vanessa. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for coming um, here. And for those of you I can't see online, I'm assuming there are a few of you. Um, when I first walked in the room, there was only one person. So I'm glad that to see that people are shuffling in now. Um, my name is Jeremy Freund. I work for a company called Wildlife Works Carbon. Um, we are a project developer. Um, and uh, the title of my talk, I have actually changed slightly from the, the um, advertised title. Um, I think that, you know, at first when I was asked to give a talk for a carbon monitoring system forum, I, you know, I'm a remote sensing scientist, so I thought, okay, I'll define a pixel and then I'll talk about spatial resolution and then I'll talk about temporal resolution. All of us, I'm, I'm not supposed to move from the podium, sorry. Um, <laughs> which all remote sensing scientists like to do. But I want to, in this talk, take a step back and I want to talk about um, some challenges and some solutions to those challenges. Um, and my goal is to get us all to maybe think about a little bit bigger than our particular expertise or our particular um, science and see how maybe some of these areas can fit together so that we can address the real problem, which is protection of forests and mitigation of climate change. Or at least that's my idea of what the real problem is or the real challenge. Um, so the talk, my talk is now called Forest Protection in the Tropics, which is fairly mundane. But the second line, reference levels in MRV, remote sensing in situ or both. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, whether we should be using remote sensing alone or predominantly to tackle these problems, whether we can't do that and we need to be on the ground and dealing with people, or whether it's, it's a mixture of both. And I think you could probably guess that my philosophy is that you need both. But I, I'll go about setting out to... Uh, prove that in this talk. Um, so you have to have a, a slide that that delves into what you're going to talk about, and I'm going to speak really quickly from now on. Um, I will note that I've been told that uh, you'll have a chance to ask questions at the end, so I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. If there's something that you wish I had spent more time on, please um, note and note it down and, and ask me at the end, and I'll stay here as long as you want uh, answering questions. We could be here all night. I'd, I'd be happy. Um, I like talking about this kind of thing. Um, so, I work for a company called Wildlife Works. I'll go into a little bit about who we are, what we do, and how we do it. Um, I'm then going to talk a little bit about key, key concepts behind avoided deforestation and, and what our particular brand of avoided deforestation means. Um, and in my mind, there are really, it's very simple, there really are two things, or two ideas, two scientific ideas behind avoided deforestation. There's reference emission level, or measuring historical deforestation, and then extrapolating that into the future. And then there's MRV, or monitoring carbon, uh, carbon pools in the present, in real time, and into the future on a recurring basis. 
I'll go into some some of my personal conclusions about um, you know sort of the philosophy behind what I, what I talked about on the title slide. I have a couple of short videos I can show you at the end if we have time. My feeling is that we won't because I tend to be a bit verbose. Um, okay, so I work for this company, Wildlife Works. Um, it's a small company, and we're a bottom-up company. And what I mean by bottom-up is we believe that. Uh, climate, change climate change mitigation starts on the ground, on the ground with, with real, real boots on the ground projects, projects. as opposed to the top down people who or the top down camp I should say calling them people sounds a little derogatory but top the top down camp that really believes that you have to have legislation in in place before anything can occur um, and you know there's I think merit to both sides but uh, if we don't get started saving forests and, and um, working with communities, I think, you know, they're going to go up in smoke. So this is a real problem. Um, yes? Excuse me. Um, we're having a problem online. Oh, okay. Would you mind stopping just sure. for a minute while we troubleshoot this? No problem. Thank you. Drink some coffee. She said they're, they're having a problem with the Adobe Connect online. By problem, do you mean that nobody heard anything I just said? Is that <laughs> is that what happened? <laughs> um, it's okay. I'm still in the introduction, so. <laughs> It'd be nice if we could get it to go because a lot of my colleagues, I think, are. Test, test, test. Hello, hello, hello. Test one, two, three. Hello? Is it it's better? I can see your message is coming up here. It says much better. Okay. Hi, Jimmy. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in. Um, okay. Uh, where was I? Right. Wildlife Works is a bottom-up company. We're a conservation company. We are for profit, and I'll talk about that at the end. If you have a question about why are we not an NGO, why are we not for, why are we not nonprofit, dealing in, in the world that we are dealing in, um, good reasons for that. Um, we believe that large scale climate change begins at the local level. Um, the company was founded in '97, a long time ago, by a guy named Mike Korczynski, who's my boss and friend. Um, we're a Red Plus project developer, and we absolutely live by the concept of paper performance. Um, Paper performance is exactly what it what it says or what it sounds like in it. Um, the old style of, or maybe the, the, another style of, of um, foreign aid or development is simply pouring money into an area that needs it. Um, we've embarked in this in this journey where we believe that in order to really make a difference and and really have a sustainable situation on the ground. Um, not only do the donors, if you were, if you will, um, do better with a paper performance system, but also the recipients of of the pay or the the um, stakeholders prefer a paper performance system in which they basically have a a system where they know where their next paycheck, if you will, is coming from. Um, it's not just a one-time lump sum payment. They're able to rely on. This, the the system that we try to create, which are which is essentially a full time job, that results in a paycheck that comes every, however often, couple weeks, a uh, month, like we're used to. This is something that's that can be fairly hard to come by in Africa and in South America. So, what we're trying to do is create a system of pay perform pay per performance projects. Um, the company was founded on two basic principles that. The requirements of wildlife conservation and wildlife habitat need to be balanced with the needs for work, kind of like I just described, and that wildlife is an asset that can help generate that, that, that same employment. Um, we're called Wildlife Works. We protect forests. I'll talk a little bit more about 
what the connection between those two things are maybe at the end of my talk, but I need to move forward with what we do and how we do it. Um, well, a little bit of, uh, of a preamble still, and then I'll get into the, the what we do and how we do it after this slide, I promise. But firstly, Red Plus is the industry that we are working in, that Wildlife Works is working in. Um, there are many different definitions of Red Plus, but one thing that I think is fairly certain is that Red Plus is much more, much, much more than just MRV. Um, there's a whole socioeconomic side to it. There's there's a, a, a purely economic side to it. There's an anthropology side to it. There's, of course, a remote sensing side, a GIS side. There's all kinds of science that is being thrown at this thing called Red Plus. MRV is a large part of it, and I will talk extensively about MRV in this talk. MRV, if you drill down, is much more than carbon accounting. Um, MRV can be the monitoring of biodiversity. Um, in fact, most Red Plus projects you'll find out there won't sell a credit, won't sell a carbon credit if they aren't monitoring biodiversity and trying to enhance biodiversity. I'll talk a little more about that in a few slides after this. Um, drilling down to MRV and carbon monitoring, I believe there are two main pillars for avoided deforestation. There's measuring threat of deforestation, and that really amounts to determining an historical deforestation rate by, by basically estimating um, uh, forest conversion over an historical reference period. And this is where your remote sensing comes in, and some GIS, but mostly remote sensing. Um, remember, throughout this talk, I am a remote sensing scientist, so if I get off into tangents, I'll try to ground myself by speaking about remote sensing. That's kind of how I tie things together. Um, the second pillar of MRV or carbon monitoring is monitoring carbon stocks. Now, you can't really monitor carbon stocks in the past. You can make a guess at it, but um, what we're trying to do with these RED projects is get a really good idea of our carbon stocks or our carbon inventory in real time and then moving forward on a recurring basis. And that's really what MRV is. Um, MRV addresses, as I said, number four, MRV addresses the very last item or measuring of carbon stocks and is an integral part of any carbon system. If you want to talk about flux, measuring biomass, verification, validation, MRV ties into all of those things. This is my clicker. Okay. So the first pillar it, that I mentioned is is called ass assessing deforestation threat or really monitoring deforestation in the past. And, and some people call it a reference emission level, some people call it a monitoring historical deforestation, whatever you'd like to call it. It involves measuring uh, land use land change. It's a land use land change problem and so it in inevitably involves remote sensing. Um, so now I'm going to get into a little bit of remote sensing. Um, and the first, I told you I wanted to talk about challenges and solutions. So one of the first challenges that I was given or presented with when I started in this industry was to monitor historical deforestation and monitor it accurately. Because when there are organizations or um, governments out there who are going to pay whoever for, for carbon credits or for, for um, avoided deforestation, they want to know that that historical deforestation has been measured accurately. And in fact, it's the most controversial issue out there in avoided deforestation right now. Right now. I can tell you that with 100% certainty, it's happened to me. <laughs> um, historical deforestation, monitoring of historical deforestation is the most important part of uh, uh, any avoided deforestation project or program. Um, okay, so I so measuring historical deforestation is a Lulu CF problem, and again, in my mind, there are three primarily primary challenges um, to measuring historical deforestation. That I think, if any of you have been uh, involved in remote sensing, and that, and I'm not referring to building satellites or engineering satellites. I'm I had a a lot of experience with that as well in undergraduate, um, in my undergraduate education, but I'm, I'm referring to working with, um, with data and, and trying to assess um, prop data products in order to estimate 
uh, an, a historical deforestation signal. The, the primary problem, I think anybody will tell you this, I doubt I'll get much, um, much argument with, this, um, with these three statements, but if so, let's talk about it afterward. Um, the, the three main challenges, cloud contamination, um, compositing and, and cloud removal often results in, in significant inaccuracies. I don't think there's any way around saying that or um, saying that that's not true. Uh, number two challenge to monitoring historical deforestation is lack of available imagery. Again, um, even after the Landsat archive was made free by, was it George Bush Jr., I think, did that? Um, just a nice thing for him to do. Um, we still don't have enough imagery. We're always looking for more imagery and there are always data holes, if you will. Um, again, that can jeopardize a temporal signal and I've been working with temporal signals for a long time. Um, I, for some reason, I always fall back on Landsat. I, I, I don't, I, I think many of you would, would understand that, that uh, feeling of, of um, comfort with Landsat, but uh, moving along, uh, number three challenge to monitoring historical deforestation, and this is a little more obscure, but I can tell you that it's real, is that it, dryland areas or areas that are not necessarily typical forest areas get either overlooked or misclassified by many global systems. And I will give you examples of that moving along here. Um, so these are three challenges that I set out, that my company and myself set out to try to address um, because it's our job to overcome these challenges. Uh, challenge number one, cloud contamination. Here is a data set called FACET. I can't remember what it stands for, but it's a lovely data set developed at the University of Maryland and also in conjunction with um, a Congolese remote sensing department called OSFAC. Both obviously world-class institutions, but you talk to Matt Hansen and he will absolutely agree that, as you can see, there are areas that just, do, they, they, they have data dropouts and that's what that red is here. Um, the black outline here is the area that we chose to measure historical deforestation. So you can see there's gonna be a little problem here. Uh, it's pretty obvious that we happen to choose an area that we're most interested in, and the reason why the data is, is gone here is because of clouds. Um, another challenge that I talked about is image availability. This same data set, while it looks beautiful, and it, abs it is a beautiful data set, but when you start getting into dealing with temporal issues or monitoring this and that across time, you start to run into issues like so. The way this this uh, data set was built was by compositing Landsat scenes. And unfortunately, they have a cloud contamination uh, threshold above which they just go to a different year and, and use a Landsat scene from that year. It's called compositing. It's been done for ages. However, you get an image that has a 1986 um, date next to a, a 2000, I'm trying to look at it. a 1984 date next to a 1989 date. And that's, that's further compounded, I didn't show you this, but within each Landsat scene, they do the same thing with each pixel. So you can see that, okay, it's good for getting a snapshot of about uh, <coughs> seven to eight years in, 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 in time. But if you're trying to look at the way things change throughout time, it just, this kind of uh, product simply can't be used, in my opinion. Um, okay, that's number two problem. Um, and I'm not just gonna talk about problems. I'll talk about some solutions too. Um, number three problem that I talked about, I have two slides on the number three problem because it affects us, uh, Wildlife Works, pretty, pretty directly. Um, our first project is in southeastern Kenya. Does this have a pointer? Because I, can I move away from the, where is it? Oh, okay. Should be, a, but how do I turn it on? Oh, uh, there it goes. There go. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So this is where our, our, our very first project is in southeastern Kenya. And I don't know if you can see this, but the green is 
is the brand new uh, Global Forest Change product. Again, Matt Hansen's product coming out of the University of Maryland, just up the road. It, it doesn't call any of this area forest. It, it, it classifies it as non-forest. Um, well, that's a problem because we say we're protecting forest. So let me move to the next slide. Um, Well, okay. Is this better? <laughs> All right. Who, who requested that? Was it Jimmy? <laughs> was it Jimmy Eggers? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, so, uh, as I was saying, um, many, uh, many of the uh, global systems coming out now do not classify dryland forest as forest at all. Um, and I gave an example of the global forest change product um, classifying the entire area that our first pro our avoided deforestation project in as non-forest. Here is a, a zoom in, if you will, of and, and using a slightly different product or different uh, data set from that same um, global forest change product. And the, as you can see, you can't see the, unfortunately you can't see the legend. Um, the legend is covered by my ugly face in the bottom right, but there's a legend down there and basically the yellow, anything that's yellow is, is 10.01 to 15%. So the brown and, and basically the yellowish is um, classified as non-forest. Um, it's, it's also classified as, it's, according to this remote sensing product, you have 10 to 15% canopy cover in these areas. Um, we happen to know that the canopy cover is much higher than that because we measured um, 11,000 trees on the ground and we measured a 34% canopy cover um, which is what we say here um, and this this was so so we know that there are some inaccuracies in these global remote sensing systems that do very well there I, I will say they do very well in in the moist tropics amazing systems you know we need these as as a scientific community we need these these um, these products, but they do have some um, shortcomings, and I think even the, the the folks that develop these products will tell you, well, you have to do an, a, an accuracy assessment before you use this product in this area, or before you use this product in that area, um, and that's you know Matt's told me that himself. So um, anyway, that that is a challenge that we've seen. Um, all right, now. Let's let's talk. Let's let's get a little more upbeat now. Um, we set about to solve all three of those, or I personally set it about to solve all three of those problems at once. It's not easy to do because those are pretty serious issues that remote sensing scientists have been dealing with for years. The fr when I first got to graduate school at UCSB, the first thing I tried to do failed miserably, and it was to try to use spectral mixture analysis in, in Malawi, actually. And I realized right away that, well, this is not just counting pixels. There, there are some serious issues that you need to get around. And I know Molly knows what I'm talking about. So this here, oh, oops, sorry. Um, I hit the wrong button. This, I wanted to show this because my solution, our solution, stems from something that was developed at, uh, the Aeros Data Center, uh, the U.S. Geologic Survey Aero Aeros Data Center by a guy named Gray Tappan and Matt Cushing, and also um, a guy named Mike Buddy. Uh, these, these are folks that I worked with in grad school at varying, varying levels. Um, and what they did is they developed a sampling system um, uh, based in GIS where, and it's too bad that this, this is covered, but essentially if you can, they figured out that if you can you don't need to, to look at every pixel to understand what's going on in a, um, in a temporal system. You can sample across space and then look at those same samples, what those, those individual dots are doing throughout time and get a good idea of what's happening throughout time, globally. What's covered is an actual um, completed raster or a land, land, uh, basically a land cover map that was derived out of, out of this um, sampling system. And this is just, I don't, this has gone almost defunct, but the system that we've developed is highly based on this, this original, it's called the rapid 
our LC, Rapid Land Cover Mapper, and it's still online. I don't know who's using it, but it's a brilliant system that kind of got overlooked except by everybody except for us. Um, okay, so we set out to kind of build a modern version of of that rapid land cover mapper and, and add some, some modern kind of bolt-ons to it so that we could try to um, address those three challenges. It was developed by myself and a guy named Kyle Holland, which some of you may know. He now is a president of a company called Eco Partners, and they do a lot of um, red project development consulting. Um, he's also a PhD student at UC Berkeley in the Environmental Science Policy and Management program. Um, it uses a sampling approach to data collection like the rap rapid land cover mapper. It does not require wall-to-wall -wall coverage, which I know is, is almost blasphemy saying in front of remote sensing people. Um, and one thing that it does that is a little less obvious is that it builds capacity because it requires teams of analysts. If you're going to start doing heads-up digitization of individual samples, you're going to need a lot of people to do it, but that, that's not always a bad thing. Um, okay, so we recently have employed this biomass emission model concept in a five-county jurisdiction in southeastern Kenya. Um, this area may look familiar because this was the area that I showed you that the global forest change product called non-forest. Um, so what we have done is we have employed a system of samples of varying density and we use a higher density in areas that we we know are changing quicker and a lower density in areas that we know are not like protected areas um, we let's see so areas with larger conversion threats sampled more densely which is what I just said um, we also substratified land use into core and edge and their core and edge components because of various studies that have shown that um, deforestation or, or conversion is happening more at at land land use patch edges than right in the in the middle. So, for instance, where forest meets savanna or where forest meets non-forest, so it's it's kind of um, stands to reason that that's where the majority of the conversion would be happening. All right. So so this is really just it's hard to see. It looks solid here, but this is just a lot of dots, a lot of samples. Same here. Same here. Okay. So. Um, here is, okay, so this is another um, area that I think, if you remember back, remember the slide with the, all the red that I showed where I said cloud contamination was an issue? Well, that's okay using this, this biomass emissions model system. As you can see, if you lay a bunch of uh, samples over the, the, the area, samples, dots, whatever you'd like to call them, um, you, you the analyst really just needs to identify if a sample falls over cloud, and that's what the blue is. And I'll talk about why that's okay. I think I have a slide to talk about why that's okay in a moment. Um, and what you, by the way, what you see on the left here is our kind of follow-on to the the um, rapid land cover mapper uh, GIS uh, cartridge that we built um, in house. So it, it basically allows you to move from one sample to the to the next zoom in on it and, and do a heads up digitization or a, a, a basically a classification, a categorical classification of that sample. Um, okay, now here's another look at that five county area with, with all the dots laid on it. And basically the way we handle the lack of avail available imagery issue is to require that each sample point be observed at least twice throughout the historical reference period. So it's okay if in the first year you had this area, entire area is covered with cloud. As long as for two of, two of the other years that you are looking at this, this, this particular area, you have coverage um, at least twice so that you can at least look at what that particular sample did throughout time once. So from time A to time B. Um, and I don't know if you can see these little red, you really can't see them, but there are a couple of red dots interspersed. And those are areas that 
were not we were not able to um, look at those samples more than once, and so they basically have to be thrown out of the the um, the system. And this we we've set a threshold of 90 percent, so at least 90 percent of the samples must be observed at least twice. And this is how we can get around requiring full wall-to-wall -wall pixel coverage of every um, of the entire area. If you if you think about how land use land change models usually work, they require full wall-to-wall -wall coverage. They require basically uh, that there's no cloud or very little cloud, and usually you end up finding two if you're lucky, three images that fit that bill. And usually those images have been heavily modified. And what I mean by modified is they've been through a, some sort of cloud removal um, uh, filter, if you will. And, and that usually re results in using imagery from a different date or some sort of interpolation. This doesn't do any of that. We do no cloud removal. We do no interpolation. and Basically, it's a categorical system that, that collects um, categorical data at these sample points. Um, now, um, I'm going to have to start speaking a little quicker here, I think. How, how am I doing on time? OK. Oh, OK, that's not too bad. So I wanted to show you this picture because this really delves deeply into, or it takes a deeper dive into why these, these global remote sensing systems cannot identify or have trouble identifying forest in dry areas. This is in that same area of southeastern Kenya um, that I showed you before where we're protecting forest. As you can see here, with, with the naked eye, anybody in this room can tell me where a field is because you see these squares and you see different shades of dirt, basically. It's in a, it is in a dry time of the year, but even in their wet season, their trees really don't have leaves. They have tiny, tiny leaves. Sorry, I moved away from the mic again. Sorry, the trees in southeastern Kenya in this acacia camifera forest, which is a, a semi-arid forest, they photosynthesize through their bark. So when you take a satellite and look at the ground, you're not looking at leaf area index. You're not looking at greenness. You cannot use NDVI here. There is no NDVI. You look, you're looking straight at the soil. So the only way to identify in these areas forest conversion is by using something else. And it, it becomes pretty obvious when you look at a, an image like this. You have to use shape, and you have to use texture, and you have to use context. So that's why we've set, this, set up the system where here's, here are the samples that I talked about. And a human being can easily say, well, that, yeah, that hasn't been converted. That hasn't been converted. Well, that one has, because it falls right in the, in the middle of the field. If you do enough of these, if you collect enough data like this, you eventually get a statistical representation of what occurs throughout time and space in these areas, something that, unfortunately, the traditional remote sensing algorithms simply cannot do, um, because they rely on reflectance, right? And they rely on the reflectance of vegetation. There is no traditional vegetation here. There is vegetation, it's, and if you ever go there, I think I have a few pictures, but the trees are, they look like they're dead, but they're actually alive and photosynthesizing, again, through their bark. The leaves are tiny, tiny little things, but you certainly can't, you get no LAI out of this. So this is a special case. Um, if you, we were in the Congo, it would be no problem, but this is, this is a very, very dry area. So. Um, and some of you who have experience with object-based image analysis, e-cognition, that kind of thing, and are thinking, well, that, that could work here. Yes, it could work, but the problem is so huge that often it's too big to use something like e-cognition and, and have it be really accurate. I've tried it, and also um, this creates more jobs doing this, so I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute here. Here's another couple of examples of what forest conversion looks like in Kenya, or in, in dryland Kenya. Um, you get all kinds of different colors because you're looking at the soil, again. Um, yeah? Okay. Okay. And in some, in some places, you probably could 
discern forest from non-forest, but it, in most cases, it's very difficult to do. So um, what we've, again, we, what we've done is, is, is laid a, a, a grid of samples, uh, especially in this image, a grid of samples, and we, we train the analysts, train analysts to see, to recognize conversion or to recognize anthropogenic activity. It's much, much, much more accurate than a computer can do. Um, than a computer algorithm can 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 give you, um, and that's what I say here. I guess uh, human cognition far outperforms automated classifications here, not in every place in the earth, obviously, but here, yes. Um, okay. So where where does all this data go? Well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on 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 the actual mathematics of taking the the sample data and turning it into something. Um, suffice it to say that you get, you get a bunch of data, you collect it over, one, in this case, one, two, three, four, five years, and you throw it all into, each, each sample has a, a date stamp, and it doesn't matter actually where the point is, all that matters is what happens to that point throughout time. So you can throw it into a logistic regression, you can throw it into a linear regression, a polynomial, whatever you think is, what, basically whatever you're, you're, you're going to get away with that the, the, the um, industry doesn't tell you that you're, you're doing it wrong. Because the, re the reason I say that tongue in cheek is here you're measuring data, here you have measured data, but once you get out into, out into this area, this is extrapolation into the future. So you can see there's a pretty big difference between using a linear model, which blows up, a logistic model, which we tend to use at Wildlife Works because it asymptotes and, in my opinion, is a much more realistic and in also in several um, pieces of literature that I've read on um, the theory of, of um, uh, finite resources. Uh, you have deforestation that's low in the beginning, speeds up in the middle of the process, and then peters out as the forest becomes scarce. So. I've gotten in, let's not say arguments, um, healthy conversations with many, many a scientist in this industry over why we should not be using linear uh, type re regression for measuring historical deforestation. But that's, that's, a, um, that's a conversation that, that we should probably save for maybe having a beer or even something stronger because <laughs> it, it's, it's a very controversial issue. Um, Okay, now let's talk about MRV a little bit. How much time do I have, Vanessa? Okay, great. So I've talked about measuring historical deforestation. I want to talk a bit about measuring um, MRV, measuring carbon stocks, and, and some of the philosophy behind that and how we do that as a company. All right, you see here some, some guys with a D tape, a diameter tape, measuring a pretty big tree. And essentially, that's how we, we measure carbon on the ground, or above ground carbon. Um, I think I can pretty much, I think all of you, having been through high school, probably know that um, if we want to measure emissions, or what would happen if you burned a tree down, you have to measure the tree and then relate that to CO2. So emissions originate from the burning of a tree. We assume that um, we're protecting a tree that would have been burned, um, but we can't estimate emissions by burning all the trees down. That wouldn't be a very good idea. So we have to measure trees. Um, the reason I put this, this Richard Feynman quote here, or this Richard Feynman philosophy here, is because I was actually surprised when I saw one of his lectures where he said that trees come from the air and not from the ground. And if you really think about how trees photosynthesize, they actually do get most of their biomass from the air. So. They're, they really are the lungs of the earth. Um, and if you ever get to see this Richard Feynman talk from 1983, you can YouTube it. It's absolutely amazing. It'll change your life. Um, he's a really weird guy, too. It's fun to watch him. Uh, weirder than me, if you can believe it. Um, so a typical tree is about half water and half biomass or living matter. And half of that is carbon. So if we know a tree is about a quarter carbon, and then we, can, we know how... How, about how much of a tree is CO2 equivalent. You just multiply the molecular weight of carbon, um, or you, you divide the molecular weight of CO2 by the molecular weight of carbon, 
In other words, 44 over 12 is CO2 to carbon, so you can get the estimated amount of CO2 that would be emitted into the atmosphere if the tree was burned. Okay. Um, why are, I wanted to have a slide here to talk about threat. Why are we protecting these areas? In, 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 why are we protecting these specific areas? Well, here's an example of uh, a project that we started a couple of years ago in the DRC that is facing extreme threat. And as you can see here, um, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo is known as an HFLD or high forest, low deforestation country in that there is extreme threat facing this, the Democratic Republic of Congo. But historically, they have not featured, there has not been that much deforestation. Why? Because they've been in uh, at war basically for the, the past 10 years or longer. They're coming out of war now and I travel to the DR Congo a lot the place is absolutely booming. It's, it's on the verge of becoming a major development country. Um, Kinshasa is changing daily uh, every time you go there. So basically there's a lot of threat of, of infrastructure being built. And I shouldn't use the word threat. There will be a lot of infrastructure. It's already coming. Um, they're building roads. They're building all kinds of um, uh, structures. and. With that comes deforestation. It's what happened in Brazil. Um, it's one of the main ways that Brazil was able to bolster their economy was to, to use their natural resources. What we're trying to do here is to make sure that the natural resources are used sustainably and not, you know, clear cutting is not used as the way to make the Congo rich. Um, so it's, it's a real threat. Um, and if you leave it to certain entities, they will go in with big machines, cut down the forest, and somebody's going to get rich on it. Well, we're trying to, that's what we're trying to stop. So at, see all this white here? This is not all natural. Some of it is natural down here. Some of it's natural savanna. But these orange, um, these orange blobs or, or, or polygons are logging concessions. And as you can see, the threat is moving northeast. Well, this is our little purple um, project. So we're right at the cusp of, of where the threat is. And they actually just built a road. Here's Kinshasa. A road was just built that comes in through, through here. So um, we did a, a very, I would say, r quite robust analysis to determine where was the best place to save 300,000 hectares of forest. And this is where we decided to do it. Um, now, what we actually did is we converted a logging concession into a conservation concession. That's one way to do things, um, especially in the Congo Basin. So let me move on. I know I'm running short on time now. Um, here is the way that we measure carbon. Um, now, I just showed you a bunch of remote sensing gobbledygook, but these are permanent plots where we actually walk to and measure. Um, and so the way that Wildlife Works and I think a lot of other avoided deforestation project developers measure carbon in real time and into the future is by using a system of permanent plots on the ground. I haven't found a way around that yet. I've heard a lot of people say, oh, you could just do it with LIDAR. Or a lot of people say, well, you can do it with a combination of LIDAR and groundwork. I've yet to see something that's cheap enough that that can get to the to these places <laughs> period um, this is you know middle of nowhere Africa remember um, and that uh, is readily available uh, I'm speaking of lidar now um, I can't wait for the day when lidar can solve all of our problems but we're not we're just not there yet and I'm again remember I said I'm a remote sensing scientist so I would love for lidar to be able to solve all of our problems but we're not there yet and we need we still need, groundwork is still incredibly important. That's a long-winded way of me saying that I believe that in situ ground, boots on the ground, measurement of permanent plots is still the way to measure carbon. All right, this is our, our project in, uh, well, it's actually two of our projects in um, southeastern Kenya. And as you can see, it's situated between two national parks. Our goal was to, was to create a, a wildlife corridor in addition to, to uh, protecting their habitat. Um, here is that purple uh, polygon you saw close up. 
with land cover and what are these funny circles and red blotches? Well, we what we did is we, and this is getting into a little more um, of the philosophy behind how do you actually measure carbon and how do you run a red project. What we did is we sat down with the communities, the stakeholders, we agreed upon areas that would surround the towns that we would remove, uh, surround, surrounding the villages that we would remove from the, uh, from the, the red project or the avoided deforestation project. That's why you see these, these circles. We actually removed um, a buffered area around the villages. We also removed any areas that were classified as secondary forest and the rest we are protecting and, and the communities are protecting with us. Um, we will reevaluate these, these uh, buffered areas after 10 years when the verified carbon standard um, makes us reevaluate our uh, reference emission levels. So it's a good time to re also reevaluate your project area. Um, okay, so this is just a way of showing you that we don't just put a fence around um, an area and protect it. We have to work with communities. Not only do we have to, we want to work with communities and stakeholders so that we have an agreeable situation where we're not going to be, you know, completely opposed by the people that were, were working, basically working in their area, the, the area that they live. Um, here is our plot sampling system in that same project. Um, some fun, a funny naming convention and, and you'll notice that some of the plots are clustered and that's because if you, oh, you can't see it at all but this is a, uh, a map of, of um, areas logged by, by previous concession holders so the, I, I mentioned that we changed this logging concession into a conservation concession but previously they had s begun to log and stopped now you can't see any of it but maybe the people online can see it um, there's, there are polygons here that you can see that we, we clustered our, our plots in an area that had been the most highly logged originally, which is here. And then this area here had been also logged, but not as intensely. And then this area is pretty much primary forest, so we, we put less plots in that area. We have 471 permanent plots, and this is about 250,000 hectares. Um, all right, getting toward the end here. But we couldn't have done any of this unless we work with communities. Free prior to informed consent, or FPIC, is a buzzword that's used in avoided deforestation, and it's a serious thing. Um, you cannot go into an area and just start measuring trees, especially in Africa. I mean, you can't do that in the U.S. either. If, you know, I know I grew up in Vermont. A lot of my neighbors, if somebody showed up in a white truck, got out, started measuring trees in their backyard, they might, they might hear a shotgun, sh shotgun blast. So it's not, uh, I wasn't like that, but um, it's, it's the type of thing, what I'm trying to get across is that free prior and, and informed consent is very important. Um, we, as a, as a boots on the ground company, establish local development committees and we work with communities and what, in the DRC, the, the local um, chiefs are called chefs de terre, and these are these guys in red with, with the crazy, um, they have like tattooed sunglasses on their face. Um, we actually have a group of, of people called animateurs that their job is to work with the communities. So simply making these avoided deforestation projects a scientific problem does not work. You cannot just look at at these programs as a from a scientific point of view. I guess that's my, my, my go the goal of this slide. And, and it's a very serious issue. Um, I think that a lot of companies, w in, when RED first started, or RED Plus, or avoided def deforestation, when this concept first began, there were a lot of companies out there who just went in and just tried to fence off areas and, and conserve them and took in the, the revenue. Well, that that's not those are people are called carbon, carbon cowboys. You've heard that term. And the industry has no place for that anymore. So <laughs> we work with communities. Um, Jerry, yeah. I don't want to interrupt you. I'm sorry. We have about 10 minutes. Okay. We have about 30 people online. Cool. So I think it might be nice to, if we can merge questions yep. with your slides, would you mind doing that? Not at all. Can I'm really almost done. Okay. Um, let's see. I have. I've got, okay, great. So ten minutes to go through these slides or ten minutes, period? Ten minutes before we lose 30 people online. 
Okay, let's let's start. Um, mm, you think I, I should start? I sent them the note that they can send questions. So just, I mean, keep going through your talk. You can take questions as we go. Okay, on. that's fine. I'm just letting you know. If anybody online, um, even Jimmy, has uh, burning questions, <laughs> then please, yes. If you have life changing, life depending questions, then then please ask them now. Um, I really only have about three more slides. So this slide is really just a bunch of pictures showing how treacherous this jungle can be. Actually, it doesn't look that bad here, but um, this is how we measure soil carbon here. We big, dig big pits, and um, now we're, we're actually measuring our own bulk density. So th that's been um, an interesting task. Um, but we use pretty fairly traditional methods, uh, you know, DBH, measuring DBH using allometric equations. For, the, for those of you that are not um, foresters or not familiar with forestry techniques, I can talk a little bit about how we measure trees and how we get from me the measurement of trees to carbon um, after after the talk. But these are the, the typically the, the carbon pools we measure. We we typically measure above ground uh, merchantable and non merchantable trees. We typically measure um, below ground uh, using a root to shoot ratio. We don't actually dig up roots for every tree that we measure. Um, we usually do not measure uh, leaf litter, and we, we sometimes measure dead wood, and sometimes we don't. Um, we usually measure soil organic carbon, uh, you can see that here. But in, as most of you know, in the, in, the, in the moist tropics, there's very little soil carbon. But in dryland areas like the Kenyan project I showed you, soil carbon is a significant pool. So we do actually measure. And this is, this is Kenya here uh, with this red laterite soil. Okay. Um, here's a quick slide on how we've chosen to, to um, address our permanent plots. We... I can't tell you everything about it because it's a bit of a, a piece of intellectual property. We get asked for this all the time, but I'm going to show you a little sneak peek of what we do on the ground. Uh, we basically take a tape, we drive a piece of rebar into the ground at the center, we take a, a regular ta uh, measurement tape and we stretch that tape to 15, 10, 15 meters, whatever the diameter of the plot is, and we start moving clockwise until we hit our first tree. We then measure distance to center, we measure angle from north, and DBH and height. Um, and then also canopy start and canopy stop. And that's how we, one of the ways we get our canopy cover measurement. Um, this is how we measure herbaceous matter. We take four nested um, one meter by one meter, it's not shown, but one meter by one meter plots. We pick up the grass, we measure it wet and dry. So we get a wet to dry ratio so that we don't have to pick every blade of grass in the forest. Um, and this, now we've started to measure our own soil bulk density in which we dig a pit and we actually pour water into the pit until it's flush with the top to get the volume and we measure our own bulk density and then we send it to the lab to get carbon content. Um, uh, oh, and sorry, this one, this funny looking one, um, this is how we measure something called act activity shifting leakage, um, which if I got into right now would take me hours and probably we'd all be arguing with each other. but. Um, activity shifting leakage is something that we have to measure and it basically is a measure of where the activity would go. It, once we protect an area, does that, does that deforestation activity simply just go somewhere else? And, do, and we have to account for that. So we have to measure the areas in which the, that, that activity is most likely to move. Um, this is how we do it. We do it basically a triangular transect and we look for stumps. Um, okay. It's not just about measuring trees. We also measure all these things here, all kinds of things, animals, water holes, um, roads, all kinds of things. Here's a, a map of, of, some, of some of the aerial transects we've done on our, on our project. Here's another map of, I believe, if I can read it correctly, um, yeah, these are elephant sightings. So we've got a lot of elephants in Kenya. Um, and one of, I, I forgot to mention, or you may have seen in the news that we have major issues with poaching. So that's one of the, the big um, fights, I will say, with in our Kenyan project. It's not, not true in our Congolese project, but um, we have unarmed rangers in our, our Kenyan project that their job is not only to, to address and protect against um, poaching, but also to 
tell to mark down whenever they see an elephant. So that this is a great way to um, monitor elegant ele elephant migration patterns. Um, we also monitor. I, this is another type of animal. Um, okay, these are collared elephants. So, so this is this is a much larger um, uh, um, elephant population monitoring system that we took part in, I believe, with Kenya Wildlife Service. So, the point is, is is that we're monitoring biodiversity as well, and this is something that the CCB or Climate Community and Biodiversity Alliance. Um, standard requires so it's again it's not not it's not enough to just measure a couple trees and and say give me my money um, these have to be extremely robust well-rounded permanent verifiable projects um, okay this it not only do we have to measure or sh do we want to measure biodiversity we need to also measure the socioeconomic impacts of our project Here's a, a, just a map of some household surveys that we've done. We've taken the results and we've fed them back into our projects. Um, and here's what it looks like to do a household survey. Um, there's a, the, the mama sitting outside doing our survey with her kid saying, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you doing this, mom? <laughs> but it's a very important thing. That's a typical Kenyan um, uh, mud house. Um, okay. Look, I'm at my conclusion slide. We're almost done here. I just want to say that, again, I'm a remote sensing scientist. It has its place. It's invaluable for measuring historical deforestation. I'm not sold on remote sensing for historical degradation yet. I'm sure we can do it one day. That's something that we can have these brilliant minds at UCSB and um, University of Washington and University of Maryland do. Um, LIDAR, it will be ubiquitous when it is ubiquitous and when it's affordable. Um, I'm not sold on LIDAR yet. I, LIDAR works when you're studying one place at one time in the US. <laughs> and you've been given a deal. It's expensive. It's hard to get LIDAR into Africa. It's not impossible. But when you have a recurring problem, LIDAR becomes challenging. Um, places like the Congo Basin, deep Amazonia, Borneo, require this free prior and informed consent or working with humans. Human interaction builds trust without a participatory transparent process. Forest protection in Red Plus will not work. And I can tell you that from experience. Um, my conclusion is that we need both. You remember in the beginning when I had this title that said computers or remote sensing in situ or both. My conclusion is both. We need to use science, but we also need to remember that the goal of this science is to affect people and to help people. We, we study climate change because the human race is interested in studying climate change. If the human race gets obliterated, it doesn't matter how hot it is on, on the earth. So this is about people. My science is about people. I know that's obvious to most people, probably in this room, but it's not obvious to everyone. So I like to say it at the end of my talks. Both science and socioeconomic type of activity I think need to be used. Remote sensing should be used as a tool, but can, we cannot rely on re remote sensing alone to, to affect these, these, these avoided deforestation projects. We have to use all types of science, including anthropology, including um, uh, even um, yeah, you know, you know, the, the fringe sciences like uh, um, some, of, some of the more human-oriented um, you know, social economic uh, sciences. And that's my belief. If we can all come together and take a step out of our office and, and kind of look at the next scientists and what they're doing and, and look at you know, uh, what different people are doing to try to address this problem, I do believe that avoided deforestation can work at scale. And that's, and that's the issue, is, is getting this to work at scale. OK, that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. You can clap. <laughs>